Good morning, House of Praise. Good morning, everybody. You're welcome to this wonderful, glorious, beautiful Sunday morning service. Uh, please turn to your neighbor, tell them hi, tell them welcome, tell them you're glad to see them this beautiful Sunday morning. Yes. You're very welcome. And to all of you who are online watching from all across the world, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, right off the bat, um, let's really appreciate God for what he did here on Friday and Saturday at the Alive Men's Conference. We're so, so grateful for the lives that were changed, the blessings that were pronounced upon each and every single one of the men that attended the conference. Um, and let us be expectant for what God is going to do for us this morning. Um, today, I have the honor of introducing to us a gospel artist, a man who is really, God has blessed him. God has given him the talent, um, who has used that talent to draw many from across the world to come to know God even more. So please, ladies and gentlemen, join me as we welcome to the stage, no stranger to House of Praise, Minister J.J. Hairston. Good morning, good morning. Praise the Lord, everybody. Can we open our mouths and give God praise? God is worthy this morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and we came to rejoice and to be glad in it. The Lord is so good and kind to us, and we came to praise, and we love you, house of praise. Thank you for having us to the pastors and all who honor is due. We celebrate you. We came to let you know that everything is working for our good. If you believe it, can you give God praise right now? Because it's working for your good. It's working for your good. Let's go, hallelujah. Come on, clap it.
believe is working for your good. Give him a shout. That's why we declare that we have no reason to fear because Jehovah has the final say. Can we clap our hands?
the flesh. They stumble and they fell. Your enemies are falling beside you. Every side, enemies are falling because God is your protection. If you wouldn't even give them a prayer. That's why we worship him, because he protects us. He deserves all the glory. If you believe it, lift your hands now. He gets the glory. He gets the honor. He gets all the praise. My desire is for in my life, be glorified, Father. And everything I say and everything I do, Father, be glorified. Lift your hands and begin to worship him now. God, we glorify you. We magnify you. We glorify you. We lift your name. We worship you.
Can we worship him? Lift your hands and lift your voices. Lift your voice. We give you shout of praise hallelujah hallelujah come on if you enjoyed the ministration of JJ Hurstein let's hear you give God thanks for that awesome praise and worship session thank you oh Lord God hallelujah hallelujah thank you please you may be seated welcome everybody welcome to this glorious Sunday morning service here at house of praise Thank you all for being a part of this wonderful, wonderful Sunday morning service. Um, I'm glad to see, wow, so many people. Um, honestly, thank you all for coming here this morning. Um, I'm sure we have a bunch of new faces who are here for the very first time. Uh, thank you for choosing to fellowship with us here at House of Praise. And of course, for those of you who are online, watching from all across the world, our online family members and all of our online new guests, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for joining us here um, at House of Praise. Uh, by the grace of God, all of this uh, is brought to you by House of Praise, one of the many parishes of the redeemed Christian Church of God around the world, with a God-given mandate to empower you to achieve your dreams, to fulfill your destiny, and to be a positive influence in your society. Now, if you're looking for a Bible-believing church uh, to, to be a part of, I welcome you to join us here at House of Praise. Um, you can join us on our Friday evening services every Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And on Sundays, you can join us at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're not able to make it in person, um, please feel free to stream the services live online. Um, you can join us at those mentioned times. Uh, the services are streamed directly on YouTube. You can follow us there at HO Praise. You can find us on YouTube. Now, um, to get a lot more information about the church, uh, to keep up to date about all the wonderful things God is using the church to do, uh, please do give us a follow on social media. We're active on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Again, you can find us under the handle at HOPraise. Additionally, I welcome you to please download our app, 
join the 30,000 plus people who have already downloaded the app. Um, the app, think of it as a hub for you to stay in touch with all the programs and events uh, that God is you know, using the church to, to bring to the world, to win souls into his kingdom. And I'm sure you'll be greatly blessed by that in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, if you are a young adult in the house, uh, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, house of Praise has a young adult expression called Ignite Church. So if you're between the ages of 17 to 35, I highly recommend that you be a part of the Ignite Church. So join us every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Ignite Church services. Um, and for the parents in the house, uh, if you have children between the ages of 4 to 13, uh, please know that we're just coming into the end of the registration for the Genesis Awana Clubs. Uh, so think of this place as a, as a training ground for your children to grow and develop in the Word of God. Uh, so please make sure to register your children. Again, it's for those between the ages of 4 to 13. Please make sure to register them for the Genesis Awana Clubs. Uh, registration closes on the 29th of October um, with classes to begin on the 10th of November. I'm sure your children will be greatly blessed by that. And by extension, you too will be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, uh, for the men in the house, I want to hear you give God a shout of praise if you were excited by what he did for us here on Friday and Saturday. We had so much fun. We had a great time in the presence of God um, from the ministration of J.J. Harristain and by the grace of God, um, the ministration from Reverend Sam Adeyemi with the blessings pronounced on each and every single man here yesterday. Um, we had a blast. Um, and I know the conference really was geared to men on Friday and Saturday, but uh, by the grace of God, we're taking the spirit of the conference and bringing it here um, this Sunday morning service uh, for, the, for everybody to to. to to be blessed by um, in the mighty name of Jesus. So again, I'm just so grateful for what God is doing here at House of Praise. Um, by the grace of God, he has used um, our lead pastor, Pastor Wale Akinshiku, as well as all the ministers and the volunteers um, as they dedicated their time, their, their efforts, their, their talents to make this a possibility. Um, and by the grace of God, it has come to fruition. It has exceeded our expectations. And we're so, so grateful for what, is, what God is doing here um, this, this Sunday morning service. So without um, any further ado, please, everybody, join me as we welcome to the stage the host of the conference, a live men's conference, the lead pastor of House of Praise. Please welcome Pastor Wale Akinshiku. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please be seated. God honor you. God honor you. Father, we thank you. We honor you. There is no king like you. Jesus, we honor you. We bow before you. Thank you for the amazing things you have done, amazing things you are doing, and the far greater things you will still do. We give you all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we worship. Amen. Good morning, church. Wow, amazing, amazing. Nice to see every one of you. You're welcome to church today. And everyone joining us, our online family, every one of you also very much welcome today. I know many of you have left your palaces, your mansions. Praise God. Hallelujah. Your palaces that make Buckingham Palace look like a bungalow. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> you know, to come in here from far and near, and we really appreciate you being here this morning. Uh, it's so nice to see our sisters back in church. Where have you been? Where have you been? We missed you. We really, really missed you. So nice to see you back in church. I want to thank every one of you, um, particularly, I know we're still going to have time to do this, but I felt this is, um, this is um, prime time. So I ought to say this uh, because it is true. In thanking God, God has done amazing things for us and through us. We give God praise for that. But we know, according to scripture, that Jesus Christ is the head. And we, the church, is the body. The head thinks, the head plans, the head sees ahead, and the head, through the nervous system, gives instruction to the rest of the body to carry it out. Without 
the body actually carrying out the instruction of the head, the instruction of the head will remain there. Uh, and that is a quote from Pastor E. Adeboe. So definitely God is doing the work, but God does it using his people. And over this weekend, we've seen the amazing things that God has done using you. And I want to thank God for every single one of you. I want to start by thanking God for our sisters. True. Now, I know it was a men's conference, but in the planning of it, we realized that. <laughs> we realized that it is a men's conference, but the truth is that this is not men's conference planned by men for men. No, 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 no. It was a men's conference planned by all for men. So I want to thank God for our sisters. They worked so hard, so hard. You worked so hard. It's unbelievable. You worked so hard in the place of prayers, in intercession, incredible intercession went into this. Um, in planning and in executing on the day, our food management team, of course, ladies, food management team, they were incredible, incredible, <laughs> incredible. You know, led by Isuke and Folake, you know, incredible. They were just incredible. Hospitality team, oh my goodness, they were amazing. Okay? They are amazing. I know. This is uh, the, 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 the guest liaison, you know, led by, I'm talking of the departments now led by ladies. You know, if you take the guest liaison out, you take hospitality out, you take the food management uh, team out, you can see that all we're going to be left with is ooh ha. Don't be not to this. So, 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 we really want to thank God uh, for, for you ladies. Once again, please let's appreciate all of our sisters, all of our ladies in the house. You are just incredible. You are amazing. And we thank God for every one of you. Okay. We also want to thank God for all of our men that also in the place of prayer, they prayed a lot, invited their friends. Many of you went out. Definitely invited a lot of your friends. Okay. Friends that are Christians, friends that are non-Christians, you invited them to come and be a partaker of the grace God has deposited upon this conference. We appreciate every one of you. And all the departments you led also, the protocol team, amazing. God bless every one of you. I know you took time off work. I know you took time off work to just to do this for this weekend. God bless you. The planning team, the event management team, God bless you. Pastor Chuma, um, God bless you and your team. I appreciate God for you. God bless you. God bless you. Just that your car that you took a photograph with, I don't know if you're going to see it next Sunday. <laughs> you know, you know, God bless every one of you. Um, I want to thank God specifically also for our pastors in House of Praise. Can we appreciate every one of them, please? Please, let's appreciate them. Let's appreciate them. Let's appreciate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing the work they've done. It's been amazing the work they've done. God bless you. God bless every one of you. God bless you. God bless you guys. God bless you. God bless you. Please be seated. It's important we, we, we celebrate God's grace upon their lives. The, you know, we have um, a lot of work that go on in the back end that you will not, uh, uh, that's not obvious, okay, on the front end like this. And our pastors are the ones that really do a lot of this work on the back end. That is why the front end looks easy. And we want to thank God for every one of you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Also for our guests that came in from different um, parts from um, Michigan. I met people who came from Michigan. Loads of them came from Michigan. Whoa, thank you. Thank you. Our Michigan crew, you see them, they're still there. I, I, I thank God for every one of you. You know, I saw people come from Chicago. I met people from Sudbury. People from different places. And of course, Edmonton is like Mississauga. God bless you. <laughs> Our crew that came in from Edmonton, God bless you, Pastor Tulu. 
God honor you and your team that came from Edmonton. Um, Pastor Barr was here also from Winnipeg and, and, and much more. We thank God for every one of you that have come from different, different places. I, make, I met a um, wonderful family friend of ours now, my son and my daughter, came in from Portland. Uh, we thank God for them also. God bless you. We appreciate every one of you. We don't take it for granted at all. We know that we are just privileged by God under his grace to host you. And we know, we thank God for you and we appreciate the fact that you've been able to come to come and honor God's invitation here. God bless every one of you in Jesus' mighty name. You know, it was in 2006, in the month of September, that I physically met Reverend Sam, who is not a visitor to House of Praise. It was 2006, September. What I'm trying to do is now to help you prepare your heart for the word that is coming. House of Praise has started in the year 2000. When Topsy and I had the opportunity and the privilege, and we started in ministry, there was no mentor. I knew about the fact that one needed to have a mentor. But coming into ministry, I didn't attach the fact that I had a mentor when I was in the corporate world. I didn't attach that and bring that into ministry. I must be very honest with you. The predominant, predominant thought at that time did not allow us to use our mind concerning spirituality. It basically told us that our mind was a hindrance to our spirituality. So anything, if you wanted to think about anything, is no, 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 don't think about why, why would you think about that? You're going to hinder the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and that was the predominant thought from year 2000. But by the time we got about year 2003, I knew it within me, but I just couldn't articulate it. That something is wrong. This thing is not right. All these things they're telling us is not true. Something is wrong. Why will God invest all of this in us, in our mind, refine our mind through education by the leading of our biological parents? And then we come into church and we drop our minds at the gates. This is not doable. but this is not good. Why will we equate educational and personal development with, why will we associate that with pride? I said, no, this is not right. But I didn't know a way out. Now, while I was gone to Nigeria between in those years, my siblings had told me about this Star Christian Center and this amazing church and, you know, this amazing man, you know. So I listened to him. Then I thought, my God, I'd go to meet him. Then I heard that he was coming to my home church, our home, home church, Jesus House, London. So I flew down to London. I knew that there and then, there is no way he's going to go into in that building that I will not find him anywhere he goes. And I know that I have access to the senior pastor's office, my pastor, Pastor Agu. I'll go in there anytime. So, and graciously, I went in there and I met him. And I told him, I said, sir, I need to see you. I'm ready. You know, sometimes when people say they want to see the man of God, they say it at their own convenience. I said, sir, I need to see you. I'm ready to fly to Nigeria to see you for a 30 minutes meeting. And in March of 2007, I did. Because I knew I needed this mentor. Graciously, he gave me two hours. First and foremost, that first meeting changed my life. I still remember the things he discussed with me, but I won't belabor you with that. It changed my life. And of course, I invited him and he came to the House of Praise in 2007. And by the grace of God, a relationship was formed. And that relationship has been 16 years now and going. Himself and his precious wife, Pastor Nike, they just took Topsy and myself as prodigies and just poured into us. They were very generous with their time and very generous. Pastor Sam also, they're very generous with his financial resources also. I have to tell you that. Yeah, I have to tell you that. I have to tell you that. I remember clearly because sometimes we need to share some of these things so that you know the impact. I remember in 2010, when we bought the land um, um, by the airport, they're five minutes from, three minutes from the airport, drive from the airport. When I told Reverend Sam, and he came to the House of Praise in that year, 
the first thing he told me he wanted to he was so eager to write a check to to sow into that particular project and he did <laughs> give the lord a big round of applause so this is not just something that is preached it's something that has been done his life has changed many lives around the world thousands of people call him pastors many of us few of us that are privileged we call him mentors He's been our mentor. He's mentored many great people across the world, uh, in the business world, and of course, also in church. We are grateful to God today to have him here on a Sunday morning. It is not something we take for light. We don't take it for granted at all. We don't take it lightly at all. And Reverend Sam, I want to say thank you so much, sir, for all these years of pouring into us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Without a shadow of doubt, the word you're going to be hearing today is going to change your life. You know, over in the Topsy and I were discussing it yesterday into the wee hours of this morning. Topsy said, man, Reverend Sam, he just came, he said, normally, it's no, we normally call him vintage Reverend Sam. That's what we say, vintage Reverend Sam. That's both of us, you know, he's not always going to deliver. But he said, this time, it's like, he came in like a lion for the man. He really, really came in, you know. <laughs> And we are so grateful for that. I wanted to open your heart this morning. I will lead you in prayer just for one minute. For your heart to be open for the life-changing, transformative word you're going to be hearing this morning. Shall we rest off it as we pray for one minute? Just in readiness for the word that will be coming. Ask God to speak to you this morning. Ask him to speak to you this morning. Father, speak to me this morning. I know, Lord, you're here. You're going to speak to every one of us. You're speaking to the world from this platform here this morning. But, Father, my own request is that this morning you will speak to me. I want to hear your voice this morning. I want to hear your voice this morning. Lord, I want to hear your voice this morning, oh God. I want to hear your voice this morning, oh God. I know you will be speaking to thousands of us this morning that are here in this building and you'll be speaking to thousands also out there online but lord god of heaven our online family but lord i'm asking you that you will speak to me personally speak to me oh god your word says in the book of luke chapter 5 jesus was sharing the word and teaching the multitude and your word says in luke 5 4 when he had stopped speaking when they finished speaking he said to simon he said to simon speak to me oh god come on pray 20 seconds more pray 20 seconds more pray lord speak to me my heart is open my heart is open i refuse to be distracted my heart is open speak to me 10 seconds more speak to me after you finish speaking to the multitude you said to simon i know you are speaking to multitudes of people today but speak to me speak to me as a person thank you my father blessed be your name heavenly father i ask that you speak to us individually and collectively today in the mighty name of jesus christ now house of praise with Jesus' joy, let's welcome Reverend Sam Adeyemi. House of praise. It's great to be back here. Everybody's looking so beautiful this morning. And honestly, I did not come to preach a powerful sermon today. I just, I just came to love on you guys. I, I wish I could hug, just hug everybody, you know. So will you help me? So help me to appreciate the person next to you. Say, just say something nice to them. You look nice, you look beautiful, you smell nice. Mm. Give them a handshake. If you can give a hug, please go ahead. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Let's have a seat. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Pastor Wale. Thank you. Um, ah, it's it's been it's been an amazing experience, like Pastor Wale shared with us. I mean, just building this relationship inspired by God. And <clears throat> I've enjoyed so much love from Pastor Wale and Pastor Tokwe. Um, I mean, like, <laughs> on Friday, Pastor Tokwe helped me to resolve something, you know, with my bank hair. And she was, I said, I said to her, today you were the angel sent from God to help me because honestly there's no way I would have gotten through there if she wasn't there. Right? And I thank God because it's, it's a privilege to mentor. It's, it's a rare opportunity from God. Because I say there's no professor of music that can put music in anybody. They can, help, they can only help you to develop what God already put there. And what I acknowledge is what God already put in Pastor Wale and Pastor Toppe. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Each time I come here, I am fulfilled. I thank God. <laughs> for the opportunity to be a part of the amazing thing God has done here and that he is still doing. I say to people in organizations, leaders in organizations, <laughs> hierarchical positioning in an organization is not necessarily a description of destiny. Okay, so that you are ahead of me today does not mean God has designed for you to be ahead of me forever. Ten years can make a world of difference. So that I have the opportunity of influencing you today is actually an opportunity that I should grasp with both hands because only God knows where you're going to be five years from now. But many people don't recognize that. They think leadership is about bossing people around and dominating people. And they think it is proof that they are superior to somebody. And then a few years down the line, they are regretting. So I am grateful that I did not miss this opportunity. What do you think? <laughs> so I, I, I know House of Praise. I know that you appreciate them. I also know that sometimes proximity does not allow us to see well enough. I mean, it's like parents. You see your child every day, and then you just find out the child never leaves being a child to you. It's the person that saw the child last year, they see the child now that quickly recognizes the change or the changes in the child. So we get used to our pastors, right? We get used to. But for once, I want you to help me to appreciate them. Help me to appreciate Pastor Wale and Pastor Tok, especially. Thank you. Let's have a seat. Heaven will applaud you too. In Jesus' name. Oh. Yes, the men's conference has been um, was amazing, right? <laughs> do, do you know what it feels like to have a big room like this filled with men and to hear those men shout hallelujah? It's a roar. <laughs> Yo, apart from hallelujah, we actually said ooh ha. <laughs> All right. You know my style. 
I take as much time as possible to greet so that there won't be too much time for preaching. Because Pastor Wale is a master. When it comes to teaching, ah! So I'm glad he didn't teach this morning. Because on Friday, that was what he did. He was supposed to introduce me. And then he was talking for like 15 minutes. Was, when he sat down, I said, what do you want me to preach now? <laughs> Who is the guest minister here? <laughs> so, through the weekend, we were sharing on the topic more than conquerors. We were sharing on the topic more than conquerors. So, like we had earlier, we want to bring the spirit of the conference in here this morning. Right? Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can I have my phone, please? Actually need it. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll read Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39 from the New King James Version. Romans 8, 35 to 39, New King James Version. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, I ask that you inspire me. You know every single one of us that are a part of this service, physically and online. You know us intimately, and I ask you to so flow through me that you would release your word for each person with accuracy. And we know that when you speak, creation harbors. Birth destiny for us today. In Jesus' name. Oh, by the way, I bring blessings, I bring greetings from my left ventricle. Right? You know my left ventricle, yeah. The part of the heart that must not pack up, or else the boss is gone. I bring greetings from Pastor Nike. Right. My very beautiful wife. Beauties in the eye of the beholder. Mm. <laughs> you have some level that is not subject to the eye to the beholder at all. It is universal. That's the one I'm describing. So our theme for the conference was more than conquerors. I remember when our last born was very young and in elementary school that I would drop her in school. That was the arrangement. I dropped the children in school 
and Pastor Nick picked them in the afternoon. Well, I got the easier part of the job because all you had to do was just drive to the gate of the school, the children got down, and you drove off. But to pick them up, you actually had to pack your car and walk to their classroom to pick them. So once in a while, I would actually be the one to pick <laughs> them up. Uh, this particular day, I w oh, well, several times, I picked our daughter, but I observed something. I observed that as we were walking through the school, she loved for me to hold her hand. It was after some time that I realized actually that it meant something to her. Because she wanted it to be clear that Pastor Sam was her dad. <laughs> it meant something to her, right? How proud does it make you feel to know that God is your dad? It's meant to do something. Don't you think we should show him off once in a while? <laughs> God is my daddy. So the passage that we read, actually when you read it in full context, is about God's love for us. So Paul the Apostle asked, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is it tribulation? Is it distress? Persecution? I mean, all kinds of things. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he ends in verse 39, you know, by saying, I am persuaded. You know, from verses 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So he is describing the extent to which he is willing to go to never lose consciousness of that love because of how important it is. Well, the passage also describes the extent to which Satan is willing to go to beat the consciousness of that love out of us. All those negative things that you see listed there. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Everything Satan throws at you is to separate you from the love of God. Because when you really look at it, when God planned to save man from the nature of sin, love was his best instrument. It's very important. So let's discuss some of the benefits of being loved. When you know that you are loved, what does it do to you? Maybe two or three of them. Number one, it shows that you have value. It communicates to you that you are valuable that you are important. John chapter 3 verse 16 means a lot. Why is it one of the most famous verses of the Bible? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave. Hmm. I have meditated a lot on that verse of scripture and I came up 
with my own definition of love. That love is the recognition and celebration of value. Love is the recognition and celebration of value in another. For example, we know from scripture that God created man in his own image. Every human being is an extension of God. So when you recognize that in a human being, you will treat people differently. When I read Matthew 25, Christ was speaking about the end of the age, then he was speaking about the judgment. You read from verse 31, and he said, that at the judgment, God would separate people. He said he would separate the sheep from the goats. He said he would say to some people, you've done well. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me water to drink. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. Christ said there would be an argument because even those people would be asking him, you, you God, I saw you. I gave you food to eat. <laughs> when did I see you? And God would respond, for as much as you did it to any of the least of these people, you did it to me. The day I got it, it changed everything for me in terms of my relationships with people. It changed everything. Because Christ said you would have this other group of people that God would tell to just go into damnation. Because I was hungry, you did not feed me. I was thirsty, you did not give me water to drink. I was naked, you did not visit me. And then there would also be an argument. You, God, I saw you hungry. What was I doing? If I saw you, God, even if it was my last meal, I would have given you. When did, I, when did I see you hungry and not feed you? And God would say, for as much as you did not do it to any of the least of these people, you did not do it to me. You know, I just saw something like a headline <laughs> in my imagination. On the last day, many people will realize that they met God, but they did not recognize him. I had to go back to the creation of man to try to understand what was going on. Because sometimes Christians think that God is only a Christian God. That God only belongs to us. Other people who have nothing to do with him will be surprised. When I went back and studied the creation of Adam, I saw, yes, that God formed man from the dust of the ground and then it says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. Ah, then it occurred to me that it wasn't only air that God put inside what he formed. No, 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 no. If it was air, I would have created human beings too by now. Yes, I will form, I will form people with mud and I will attach a pump. <laughs> and I will pump into their nostrils, and they will become living souls. In fact, I, I, there is no way I would have allowed my wife to go through the pain of carrying pregnancy for nine months. That's how we would have made our babies. <laughs> God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. God literally caught man. The physical part of man he formed from the Thus, but the spirit and the soul of man he caught out of himself and dumped inside that body. And that first man that he created, you will notice he's not done that since then. Because the name Adam means mankind. That one man was called mankind. And that's why when he sinned, the sin tainted all of us. And when God would bring the last Adam, he had to sidestep the first Adam and plant Christ directly in, his, in Mary's womb. Every human being, whether they speak in tongues or not, whether they are born again or not, every single human being is an extension of God. Whatever you do to man, you've done it to God. If you didn't know before, hear it now. A 
anything you do to man, you've done it to God. Christ said so. The only thing is, I remember when I was in school. See, when a student is dull, the student is dull. Even if you give the student the questions <laughs> ahead of the exam, they will still fail. That's what will happen on the last day. Because Christ already gave us what we call the marking scheme. He gave us the curriculum. He gave us the marking scheme. This is what we would use on the last day for assessment. Some people will still fail. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? Yeah, he said some people will fail on that day. They will still be arguing. When did I see you? When did I see you? He already said it. Anything. In fact, I like the way Christ qualified it. For as much as you did it to any of the least of this, just in case your human nature would come in and you begin to categorize people and you will prioritize powerful people over weak people, he went for the lowest. For as much as you did it to any of the least of these people, you did it to me. So I said, excuse me, there's no way you can be a godly person, do it God's way, and ever entertain mediocrity. If your job is to clean chairs, clean the chairs as if it is God that will sit on the chairs. You can't be a Christian and do a shoddy job. So, love is the recognition and celebration of value. So, so I recognize value. So, for God so loved, God so recognized the value in the man that he created that he sacrificed his only son. What is that supposed to mean? And that's supposed to communicate to us that in God's perception, we are what the life of his son. Am I right? Yes. That's what it means. Why would he sacrifice his only son? It means that in his own estimation, we are worth the life of his son. So that's what I'm saying. One of the benefits of being loved. Anybody who's been loved knows that. When you are loved unconditionally by someone, it, it communicates to you that they value you. And the moment you begin to do that, you will spot gaps. You will spot gaps between where they're supposed to be and where they are. You will spot gaps between their potential and their reality. And love will motivate you to bridge the gap. For God so loved the world that he gave. The man that he created was designed to be sinless. Now he had the sin nature. So he gave his son to bridge that gap. Get the sin nature out of us. Put his own nature back in us. The proof of love is giving. The proof of love is giving. Not only giving, but sacrificial giving. So we know John 3.16. How many people know 1 John 3.16? First John 3.16 says, this is how we recognize love. In that he laid down his life for us. So ought we also to lay down our lives for the air. <laughs> that the proof of love is not just giving, but sacrificial giving. Because you are trying to bridge gaps. You see, you see someone hungry, they don't have food to eat. Wisdom tells you that it is beneath their dignity. As people created in the image of God to not have food to eat, then you give them food to eat because they should not die of hunger. Somebody created in the image of God. Being loved communicates to you that you have value. So we call that value self-worth. Being loved gives you self-worth. And there are many derivatives of that. In other words, it changes the picture you have about yourself in your head. Am I right? What do we call that picture? Self-image. Self-image. Being loved improves your self-image. Being loved gives you a positive self-image. 
Another derivative of that is self-esteem, which is how you feel about yourself. Being loved improves your self-esteem. When you study self-esteem, you will realize it's every man's problem, every man's battle. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, probably the first manifestation of sin was low self-esteem. Because the Bible says God came into the garden as he often did, you know, and that he ran away. Because you have self-worth, self-image, self-esteem, self-confidence. They lost all that. Low self-esteem. Practically everybody battles with it. A lot of people don't like the person they see in the mirror. I was there. It's just you see yourself in the mirror and, and you don't like yourself because of the circumstances of your life. And then you begin to wish that you were living somebody else's life. You, you be comparing yourself with other people. You know what Adam and Eve did to solve the problem? Because the Bible says, it says that they saw that they were naked. You see that? Now they were seeing themselves as being less than they did before. And the Bible says that they went to cut fig leaves to cover the nakedness, to make up for the loss of value. Fig leaves. A man is still cutting fig leaves still now. Yeah. The only problem is your own fig leaf may, be, may look better than mine. Using material things, it could not solve the problem. It could not solve the problem. So, when someone loves you, they communicate value to you, it boosts your self-confidence, boosts your self-esteem, shifts your self-image. And now we are talking about God loving you. We're talking about God loving you. We battle with self-acceptance because the world communicates that lack of acceptance to us. The people you're comparing yourself with, they're also battling within their, their own internal battles. They may have a bigger car than yours. The car is a fig leaf. The fig leaf is just bigger than your own fig leaf. <laughs> They're still battling. A lot of successful people still battle with internal battles when it comes to self-esteem. We call it imposter syndrome. You just get a big breakthrough, get a big promotion, and, and there's a voice speaking to you. They will soon find out. You think you're really qualified for this? Do you really deserve this promotion? Eh? Look around. Do you really deserve it? You know? Do you really know this job? You don't. You just happen to answer the questions correctly. Or maybe the, the, your CV, they did not help you to package it. <laughs> You'll be amazed. The successful people that you are envying are battling, fighting internal battles. Because there's a voice telling them that they're not deserving of the promotion that they got. And that someone will soon find out. They will soon give you an assignment that you won't be able to execute. <laughs> <laughs> then the truth will be out. It's amazing. It's a fight. So the game changer the game changer that forms the foundation for Christianity is the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. And the fact that when he died, in God's estimation you died, God has credited his death and resurrection into your account. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, you remember, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Your, your record is clean. And now God sees you the way he sees Jesus Christ. Because 
he gave his son for you. In his estimation, you are worth the life of his son. So in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul the Apostle says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet it's no longer I that live, it is Christ that is living in me. It's a game changer for me. Anytime I'm beginning to think like, oh, I'm not qualified for something, oh, somebody's going to refuse me something, Galatians 2, 20, I quote it almost every day. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. The me that should have been refused is dead. The me that was not qualified is dead. Dead and buried. Romans 6, 3 says we are buried with him through baptism into death. That as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live. It is Christ that is living in me. So whatever cannot be refused, Christ, must not be refused me. If I'm going somewhere and I'm going to ask for something, say, thank you, Lord, because they will not see me. They will see you. They will not hear me. It is you they will hear. Whatever you deserve, that's what I will get. Someone say a good amen. Amen. So you are valuable. You are special. Look at yourself again and fall in love with yourself. <laughs> if the Lord of the universe, the creator of the universe, sees value in you, why should you not see value in yourself? Whose verdict should you believe? If Satan ever told you you were not deserving, oh, you're a failure, he lied. So you understand today why Satan is attacking marriages, attacking homes, you know, to push fathers out of the homes. Because we are meant to imitate God's example and love, love our wives, love our children. Amen? Amen. So Satan wants to afflict people, even before they they know what's going on, afflict them with rejection, afflict them with abandonment. It then becomes difficult for people to imagine God as father because they were abandoned by their physical fathers. But Satan failed. Today is a day of healing for someone. Today is a day of resurrection. Today is a day of restoration for someone in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You have a heavenly father and he is, quote and unquote, madly in love with you. (laughs) Woo! Following closely on that is the fact that Being loved delivers you from the pressure for performance. Being loved unconditionally delivers you from the pressure for performance. Because when you are truly loved, you don't need to do anything to deserve that love. You want a good description of it? It's in Romans chapter 5, right? I believe from verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, it must puzzle God that even as Christians, without his love, when he loved us, when we did not deserve it. Did you hear what I said? (laughs) While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The next verse. Okay, sorry. Let's reverse. Let's reverse. To verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. 
Yet, perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God <laughs> demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, even when you've committed murder, it doesn't change anything. You know, that story, that parable that Christ gave in Luke 15, we, we call it the parable of the prodigal son. It was misnamed. So we put the focus on the prodigal son. It was not about the prodigal son. It was the father that Christ was actually drawing attention to. It's the parable of the loving father. Parable of the father who loves unconditional. This guy said, give me my inheritance. He said, take. But God so loved the world that he did, he gave. The guy took the thing, went away, and they said he spent it on prostitutes, spent, wasted the money. And then at the end of the day, when, when he was taking care of pig, looked at pig's food, and, and was craving pig's food, then he came to his senses. He said that he came to himself. And then checked, that's what strategic people do. Where is my best point of leverage right now? <laughs> Where, where can I put the least effort and get the best result? I will go to my father. I will go to my father. And, and the Bible says when the guy showed up, the father jumped up, you know, ran to him, hugged him, kissed him, and then killed the father's cow and threw a party and celebrating. And his brother who had been around came and said, ah, what's going on? See? See the difference between the father and him? If it was him, he would have punished that young man. <laughs> Many Christians are like that. Because they are aware of how some people have lived their lives, the mistakes they have made. They, 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 if they had the opportunity to advise God. <laughs> because they are secretly expecting that something bad will happen to someone because of the kind of life they lived and the mistakes they made. Ah, I come from a part of the world where we don't realize that wickedness is part of the culture and that we drag God into it because something bad happens to someone and we say in pidgin English, God catch up. <laughs> a total mischaracterization of God. He doesn't catch people like that, my friend. <laughs> he's not looking for who to catch. He's a loving father. Amen. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so, you remember the first temptation that Satan gave Christ? And the temptation, if you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread. Pressure for performance. If you are who you say you are, prove it. Hey. Once you bite that dangerous, poisonous fruit, you're in trouble. Performance. And the question I always ask, did Christ have the power to do it? Yes. Did he do it? No. We say, Satan, I'm not coming down that road with you. Because at the river Jordan, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well. I love this guy. Before he had done anything, he had not performed any miracle, he had not opened any blind eye, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It is Satan that introduces the performance thing for you to get approval, for you to buy love. Ah, it was like Satan would say, ah, that is, mm -hmm. it doesn't work like that. It's not enough. It's not enough. We need to prove it. If truly you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread. And Christ said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, 
not by these fig leaves, not by the material, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, you see, the Father loves me, I love him, I trust him. Anything he says is what it is. So whatever he calls me, that's who I am. He said I was okay without me doing anything. So why should I now begin to struggle to do something to prove what? To get what I have already. There's no need. <laughs> no need. We were successful before we started trying. I hope somebody had that. <laughs> it's like I draw the attention of Christians to 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. There was a work of exchange on the cross of Calvary. He said he was rich, that he became poor, so that you through his poverty may become rich. There was an exchange. He took the poverty, didn't he? Yeah. When he took the sin, he took the consequences for sin. He took the poverty on the cross. So what are you still doing with it? What are you doing with the label? <laughs> he said he took the poverty so that you might become rich. So in God's estimation, you have become rich. So uh, the equation for us is different. You are not a poor person struggling to become rich. You are a rich person already taking practical steps to express your wealth. <laughs> oh. I pray for someone here today to be delivered from perfectionism. You, you won't feel okay. You won't feel. You you won't be satisfied with yourself. You 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 beat yourself down just because you made a small mistake. It must be perfect. Be delivered. It's not a perfect world. You are not a perfect person. It's not a perfect world. Hmm? Your husband is not perfect. Your wife is not perfect. They cannot be. Give up. Ah. <laughs> We want to read perfect children, but we're not perfect parents. <laughs> oh my. So the, I had a comedian in Nigeria describing how parents tell their children, when I was your age, I always came first in the class. Until the day the child was rummaging through things in the house and found the report card of the parent. <laughs> that does not excuse us from aspiring to do our work with excellence. The only thing is we do that work out of love, not out of pressure. Out of love. You give other people the best that you can. And like Jesus said, if I, you go the extra mile, deliver more than they're expecting because you love them. Because you see them through God's eyes. And they are deserving of the best. I'm not under pressure today trying teaching here. So what will I teach? What will I provide with? God loves each person here. He knows each person intimately. And that was why I prayed. You know each person intimately. Just flow through me. So that something will be delivered that will be useful for each person. That's all. So, so let God love through me. You are delivered from the pressure of performance. Let me add one more. Let's add one more. Knowing that you are loved delivers you from fear. And associated emotions. Knowing that you are loved delivers you from fear. It delivers you from anxiety. It delivers you from doubt. And 1 John chapter 4 verse 18 says so. 1 John 4 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love.
casts out fear. Because fear involves what? Torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So when you know that whether I make a mistake or not, whether I do the right thing or the wrong thing, my father loves me all the same. Right? It, it, takes, right? it takes the fear out. <laughs> if you grew up in Nigeria and you are male, the likelihood is as a child, you played football. You played soccer. How old was I when my dad began to buy me balls, football? The first time he brought a ball home, I was almost, I almost freaked out. <laughs> you know, just arrived from work in his car. And then stepped out of the car and brought the ball. It's like, what? <laughs> anyway, some years later, I was going, I think I was, you know, maybe a teenager now, <clears throat> early teens. And I was practicing with my ball you know, practicing. So, I began, to, I was playing the ball against the wall of our building. Now, it was three floors. We lived in the middle. Our apartment was in the middle. And I was just kicking the ball against the wall. The ball would come back, I would kick it. And my dad came on the balcony, saw what I was doing, and saw the risk. <laughs> So it was, I was kicking the ball against the wall. It was not the wall of our own house. We were, remember, <laughs> middle floor. It was the wall of the neighbor's house. And there were two windows. <clears throat> and in my, with my professionalism <laughs> in football, <laughs> I was <laughs> playing the ball against the wall between two windows. So my dad warned me, <laughs> ah, be careful, be careful. <clears throat> Look, <clears throat> professionals get all the time what amateurs get once in a while, right? <laughs> because of my trust in my professionalism, I continued until I just had the glass break. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Especially since my old man had warned me. And the neighbor whose glass I broke was a very tough man. <laughs> ah. So, somehow I think they even already had upstairs that I had broken the glass. So, <laughs> I went upstairs. I, went, I did not want that neighbor to come out because he could beat the hell out of me. So, I... I went, I, I went up with humility, <clears throat> and my dad just came out and said, you broke the glass, right? <laughs> then he went inside, <clears throat> took money, and pointed it, and said, and there was somewhere not far from our house where they sold the paints, the window paints. He said, take, go and buy the window paint. Ah. <laughs> Africa, African father. <laughs> I thought this is a trick. <laughs> that if he laid his hands on me that day, <laughs> ah, I could not move. He said, Thank. <laughs> so take my friend. So at some point I felt that he meant it. So I approached. <laughs> and he gave me the money. And I went, bought the pain, window pain. <clears throat> and in fact, he was the one that fixed it for the neighbor. So I knew mercy before I knew its definition because I experienced it that day. 
I deserved some good beating. And he overlooked it. Perfect love casts out fear. There is no fear in love. You see, not that we should not discipline because we love, but that even when we discipline, the person receiving the discipline should know that we're not visiting our vengeance on them, our frustration on them, that we are correcting them for their own sake, right? Because they did not have boundaries. So we discipline to help them to establish boundaries. It is the, the son that the father loves that he chastens, right? That he chastises, that he corrects. Perfect love casts out fear. When you are truly loved, you know that the person who is loving you has your back. You know that if something was to come against you to harass you, that this person would stand up for you. Am I right? That's the kind of a relationship that David had with God in the Bible. And you would get it when you read Psalm 23, one of the most famous chapters of the Bible. Should I read it? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Someone say a good amen. amen. You lead me beside still waters. I'm not battling with wild emotions. I'm not battling with fear. I'm not battling, you know. With, with anxiety, you give me peace because you are with me. You are my shepherd. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, now you know that's extreme, right? Extreme. So I will fear no evil, no trace of anxiety. Why? Because you are with me. And then when I come through those seasons, of terror, of temptation, of, of strong trials. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil. So even when, while I'm looking at the enemy, I have no trace of anxiety. I have no trace of fear because there's nothing the enemy can do as long as you are with me. So, through the weekend, there was a verse of scripture I was sharing with the men because the Holy Spirit dropped it in my spirit and said I should use it to prophesy on everyone. Proverbs 31 verse 23, her husband is known in the gates where he sits amongst the elders of the land. And the Holy Spirit said he is positioning us now at the gates, at the places where you make decisions, decisions over cities, decisions over nations. So I see promotion coming. House of praise, I came to announce a new season. What will happen in the next one year is going to be amazing to some people. And Pastor Wally shared, God gave him a word, he shared it with us, and you will be changed into another man. Yeah. This is a shift. Yeah. 
I said, this is a shift now. When I, when I prophesy what God has said to everybody, I prophesy it for myself. Because the word is not from me, so I have to receive it too. Honestly, this is a big shift for me. In the next one year, you're taking over territories. What made the difference with Joshua and Caleb? Why were they fearless? A whole generation that was brought out of Egypt were afraid. The lead, top leaders of the tribes came to the border of Canaan. They sent them as spies and, and see the words that were coming out of their mouths. Oh, the place is filled with giants. Oh, it's impossible. Oh, it's a land that swallows up its inhabitants. Oh, this, oh, that. in fact, we're dead. And we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. And so we were in our own eyes. Hey. And Joshua and Caleb said, no, no, we're not part of this deal at all. We are not grasshoppers. God has given this land to us. God loves us. He's given this land to us. <laughs> it's not something we need to struggle to do. He has given it. And I'm saying to someone here, God did not position you on this planet to be a struggler. You are here to occupy space on his behalf and to establish his values. It's time to possess the culture-shaping platforms. We've been wonderful, amazing. God works in dispensations. He works in seasons. We started fantastic, but it's time to move on. Entering Canaan is different from leaving Egypt. Entering Canaan is different from leaving Egypt. Let me say it again. Entering Canaan is different from leaving Egypt. To leave Egypt, you need raw power from God. Right? And everything that happened to Israel was symbolic of what would happen to us. The lamb had to be slain. The blood had to be put on the doorpost. Israel had to travel three days to be able to cross the Red Sea to get into the wilderness and escape forever from Pharaoh. Everything describing what Christ would do through his death and resurrection. But when it comes to the practical manifestation of establishing the kingdom of God here, it's Joshua style. Moses was so emotionally involved with those people that came out of Egypt. Eventually, he got angry. He himself did not enter the promised land. Because it's a different mindset. And when you get to that point, you can't be emotionally attacked with anybody. Whoever is ready, go in. Whoever is not ready, let them stay in the wilderness. The moment they stepped into the promised land, manna ceased. It's not miracles now, it's principles. You've got to walk the principles. Praying wilderness style prayers will not help you. I promise you that. What does that tell you? God is saying to Joshua and the rest of Israel, what I have given you power and opportunity to do, I'm not going to come down to do it. I'm not doing it. I was giving you free food. Free food is finished. Cultivate, take seeds. Cultivate the ground. Plant the seed. The harvest is what you will eat. Manna, finish. But to do that, you've got to trust absolutely in God's love. Amen. And you've got to be fearless. You possess your Canaan with faith. Trust absolutely in God's love. It's not your struggle that would deliver what God has designed. Before Adam was created, your destiny was designed in Christ. It is destiny. Do, do it Jesus style. John 5, 19, and we pray. John 5, 19. The son can do nothing by himself, right? Then answered Jesus and said to them, the son can do nothing by himself, but whatever he sees the father doing. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. The next verse is what I want you to do. For the father does what? Loves the son. And does what? And shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater things than these. Christ said, come to me all of you that labor and are heavy laden. 
One translation said, all of you that are tired and are carrying a heavy load. He said, learn from me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Don't be a hardaholic. Hmm? Addicted to hard life. People that come from where I came from, the part of the world that I came from, it, we, we grow up with it. We are addicted to hard life. Anything that is not painful or hard, we are suspicious of it. It's one of the major reasons why we've not been innovating. We are suspicious. When something is very easy, we are suspicious of it. We like the hard one, the difficult one. You come into Christianity like that, it's a sign of low self-esteem. You've not yet received God's love. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Jesus. In the next one year, one phone call will change your status. You will wake up in the morning and the Holy Spirit will put something on your heart. Talk to this person. You act on it, everything changes. He said the son can do nothing by himself, but whatever he sees the father doing. So whatever, what was Jesus saying? Anything you see me do down here, the father already did it spiritually. I'm only doing physically what the father has done spiritually. This, this, this process is easy. Stop struggling. For the father loves the son and shows him. So Christ was saying, anything you see me do that you guys call miracle, miracle, and you're shouting. He said, the father gave me video clips. <laughs> ahead. Played the picture in my imagination. Easy life. It's time for grace. What God is delivering in the next one year is coming on the frequency of grace. So take a minute to thank him for his love. Just remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Painful, shameful death on the cross. Painful. Shameful death on the cross. Painful. Shameful death on the cross. Remember. Painful. Shameful death on the cross. Painful and shameful death. Thank him. Ah, ah. For the wages of sin is death. And Christ absorbed that death. All the pain, all the fury. <clears throat> That we deserve because of the sin nature. And Christ absorbed everything. For God so loved. Forget the whole world. Put your own name there. For God so loved. Psalm Adeyemi that he gave his only begotten son. And Romans 8.32 says, If God did not spare his son, how will he he not with him also freely give us all things? Ah, Father, thank you for this love. This love is too much. This love is too much. Reckless love. Woo-hoo! <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Lord. Ah! Love that we could never deserve, never pay for. Ah! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Painful, shameful death on the cross. They mocked you. They nailed you. They put a crown of thorns on your head. They used a rod to beat it. They whipped you with lashes. Whips with 39, you know, 39 strands. Wrapped it around your body with thorns. Pulled it and tore your flesh. All for me, just so that I would not have to carry the consequences for sin anymore. Ah. I don't deserve it. I could never earn it. You still gave yourself away. Thank you. We're grateful. We're grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, 
Heavenly Father. Ah, what love. What love. You could just have decided to just let this, just wipe this planet out of existence. But you created us out of love. And you, so you could not leave us. Even us humans, we go to the space station, then we take pictures of the earth. And human beings don't even show. Infinitesimal, like tiny. Tiny. We don't even show. But you still so loved us. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You stepped out of eternity, took on human flesh to feel what we feel, and then you went to the cross. Though you did not deserve it, you absorbed the punishment. <laughs> and today, Satan wants to afflict us, and you tell him, look at my sacrifice, look at my sacrifice. Don't touch that one, look at my sacrifice. So we say thank you. And now, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I prophesy on your sons and daughters. I prophesy, I prophesy, the days of harassment by Satan are over. In the name of Jesus, we make an announcement in the realm of the Spirit. Tribulation trials, joblessness, rejection, failed marriage, failed relationships, no money in the account. We declare here today, they will never succeed in separating us from the love of God. Father, we love you back. Ah! We know we can't do it. To the measure to which you do it. But gratefully, your word says that your love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, we love you back. We love you back. Thank you, Lord. I prophesy on everyone under the sound of my voice. Every negative picture that Satan planted in our hearts concerning ourselves, every lie Satan told using our performances to define our identity, I declare those lies are destroyed. I receive for each one a new vision. A new vision of you. The way God sees you. Ah, thank you, Lord. I receive for each one an infusion of power. An infusion of faith. An infusion of confidence. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of fear. Go in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of anxiety. Go in the name of Jesus. And now, Heavenly Father, as we step out, Step out into the sunshine of your love. Step out with springs in our steps. Step out with confidence in you. Like David, we're going to run against the Goliaths that terrorize our nation and our world. And I prophesy the giants are coming down. The giant of ignorance is coming down. I receive for someone here today your voice. Receive your voice. Your voice of authority in the name of Jesus. You spoke before, no one minded you. No one paid attention. I prophesy now because it won't be you. It will be God speaking through you. The world will listen to you now. At the sound of your voice, things will move. In the name of Jesus. I prophesy on someone favor. Now that you see yourself the way God sees you, and now that you love yourself, <laughs> now that you love yourself, I prophesy, people will fall in love with you. 
all strangers will love you, they will not be able to explain why. And it will be the God in you that they will love. Favor on a new dimension. Someone who forgot you a long time ago will remember you now. It's your season of favor. Policies will be suspended for your sake. It's your season of favor. And I prophesy you will attract resources now. Like you never did before. You will attract people now. <laughs> Helpers of destiny. People that will help you to execute your divine mandate. In the mighty name of Jesus. You will attract material resources. Real estate. Equipment. Like never before. It will be easy. You are attracting financial resources. Like never before. Because God loves you. And people will love you. You are attracting new opportunities. I prophesy on someone a change of label. Change of label. Change of title. In the name of Jesus. So on the cross of Calvary, Christ took our place. The Bible says he made him to be seen for us who knew no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 That we through him might become the righteousness of God. So I call on someone here today. If you are honest enough to admit my relationship with God is not okay. I can't say that I'm a child of God. But today I accept Christ paid the price on my behalf. I want God to forgive me. If you are honest enough, whether you are present physically or attending online, can you put your hand on your heart? I'm a sinner. I cannot be lying before God, but I want God to forgive me today. I want to make that exchange today, and I want to be free from fear. I want to enjoy the love of God. God bless you for your honesty. God bless you for your honesty. I want you to put your hand on your heart and let's say this short prayer together. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I thank you because now I know you love me. I know you love me. That's why you sent Christ to die for me. So I ask you today, forgive me. Accept me as your child. Teach me to know you. Teach me to love you back. In Jesus name let me pray for you if your hand is on your heart and you are here can you remain standing while others have their seats if your hand is on your heart remain standing while I pray for you Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ I pray for my brothers and sisters who said this prayer Jesus you said there is joy in heaven among the angels when just one person repents <laughs> Woo! There's a party in heaven when this happens. I thank you, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, we ask, teach them to know you personally. Teach them to love you. Teach them to serve you the rest of their lives. Thank you, Lord. The nature of sin is removed from them. Your nature is in them now. We are grateful. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please have your seats. They said there's a party going on in heaven. Let's join the party. Give Jesus a big hand clap and some shout. Hallelujah. Thank you. Let's have a seat. I'll take my seat in a minute. <clears throat> Pastor Wally, have you taken our offering in this service? Not yet. Can I pray over the offering before we give?
Okay, so, so, so this is what I just want to say. So, people give for various reasons. People give for various reasons. I was on the TV interview in Nigeria, so was it last week or so, or two weeks ago, and they were asking me questions about giving and things like that. And I said, look, the, the thing is, under the old covenant, people gave out of fear. I said, under the new covenant, we give out of love. How can we ever pay back this love? God's son sacrificed on the cross. God gave his best. God gave his best. <laughs> Come to think of it, what do we have? What really do we have? And in his economy, the way he designed it, when we give money, we're not sending the money to him in heaven. He doesn't need it to have lunch. He doesn't need it to buy a car. What he says is that we should do, use it to express his love. So we use it to increase our capacity to reach more people with the message of his love and to take care of people practically in church. People who don't have food, people who don't have, you know, that's, that's what the money is used for. So, but the motive is love. I remember, I, I remember the joy I had the first day I had the capacity to write a check for one million naira, right, in the Nigerian currency, to, to write one and to put six zeros behind it and then the dot and two other zeros <laughs> to the house of God. I was elated. I was happy. I was happy. How can I ever pay? I, I, I serve God with passion. I hear some people say, mm, what is it? Especially when you make demands on them to serve God. You know, in church, they say, what is it? At least they're not paying us anything. I say, eh. <laughs> I told them in this time, I must never, don't even go there. They're not paying you what? You were paid up front, my friend. You were paid up front on the cross of Calvary and you should spend the rest of your life trying to pay back and you will never be able to pay back. The first generation of Christians understood it. That's why they were, they were dying willingly. And today you have a generation who the, the most important thing about their relationship with God is what to get. How to get a car, how to get a job, <laughs> right? And when you really look at the scenario, when you look at the context, you see that those things are meant to be fringe benefits. I know God doesn't want to see me sick on the bed because I'm valuable. I'm, I'm, I'm giving back, right? I'm loving him back by trying to reach as many people as possible with this message. Why should I be looking for what to eat? Distraction. He would take care of that. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added. He said, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink. He said, after these things, the Gentiles seek after. <laughs> Why should we now be chasing the things that Gentiles are supposed to be chasing? Come on. I'm asking someone today. Amen. Love on God. Love on God. God so loved that he gave. The proof of love is giving. Stop being dead. Stop worrying about how much do we have? What's the, how much is the money? What is it? He has better things coming. What I'm seeing for the next one year. What I'm seeing for the next one year. These fringe benefits are fantastic. So, I want to pray over our giving and then we'll go ahead and give. Heavenly Father, thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you. Because I have not spoken my words. I've spoken your words. And we ask, Holy Spirit, help us to love on the Father today. Christ said the Father loved him. And he responded with obedience. And obeyed the Father 
to the point of laying down his life. So I ask Heavenly Father, speak to each person here today and just teach us to love you. Teach us to trust you. Teach us to let go of fear in the area of our finances. Teach us to trust you. And so Heavenly Father, as we give in obedience, I ask for miracles. I ask you to prove your word. I ask you to do something for each person that we could never do for ourselves. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the person who is lavishing their resources on you today. Lord Jesus, a woman did it. Poured expensive perfume on you. And you said her story will be told forever. And we're here over 2,000 years. We're still talking about her. Let it be, Heavenly Father, that today someone will do something. Lavish love on you that will cause their names to resonate for a long time. Give someone here today a transgenerational blessing in a way that 10 generations from here, they won't find one poor person in their family. Give someone a heritage of greatness. Heavenly Father, I hear something in my spirit. You will help someone here to solve a problem that generations before could not solve. You will help someone to solve a national problem and they will be compensated in return. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Come on, church. Can we appreciate? Can we appreciate the ministry of Reverend Sam? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I'm sure we're doing our giving. I'll just, for those who are not familiar with the ways that you have to give, for those who are new today, maybe you are online. On the screen, you can do it in three ways. We can give by text to give through uh, Interact, finance at houseofpraise.ca, as well as with the app. So please do so. And as we, um, oh, a quick note for those who give their lives to Christ today, we're really, really glad you've joined the family. You would have, got, you would have gotten some material. Uh, so please, the form that was given to you, please fill it out and give it back to the ushers. And then look out for an invitation for a session, a one-hour session, talking about what you've done, the experience you've had, and the next steps that you can take. All right. So usually when we give, we, uh, we sing, we, we worship. But today we have the privilege of being ministered to by a choir that was put together specifically for the men's conference. So if you were not here, okay, thank you. For those who were blessed at the men's conference, you have the opportunity, the wider church, the wider ministry, to experience uh, the men's choir. So please... Give a down payment because of love for, for the ministration of the House of Praise Men's Choir. Come on, let's bless them. Jesus, 
that gives me such joy, 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 joy. Well, I can sing, sing, sing. Well, I can sing, oh yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me sing good, 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 good. Well, I can serve, serve, serve. I can serve, well, I can serve. oh yes, my Lord. There's something about the spirit of Jesus that makes me serve good, 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 good. Do you feel good, good, good? Do you feel good? Then clap your hands. Because there's something about the spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good, good, good.
Nazi. Oh, a humble Nazi. See, I'm born. Wahamba Nazi. Oh, a humble Nazi. Oh, a humble Nazi. See, I'm born. Wahamba Nazi. Oh, a humble Nazi. Oh, a humble Nazi. Siya bonga, wahamba nati. Oh, wahamba nati. Oh, wahamba nati. Siya bonga, siya bonga Jesu. Siya bonga unyama Jesu. Siya bonga Jesu. Siya bonga. Siya bonga Jesu, Siya bonga Oyama Jesu, Siya bonga Jesu, Siya bonga. Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power to the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God he is wonderful. Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power to the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is wonderful. All praises be to the King of kings and the Lord our God, He is wonderful. All praises be to the King of kings and the Lord our God. 
Hallelujah. Please let's appreciate God's grace and gift in the men's choir. Hallelujah. 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 Just remain standing. We're going to just going to say a short prayer and then we're going to close the service. First, I want to appreciate God once again for every one of you for coming down here today. All of our volunteers, starting from the traffic department, are here. They were here yesterday, even before very, very early, maybe about 6 a.m. or there, thereabout. Uh, and I want to thank God for you, the facility management department that get everything ready and turn around the whole place between Friday and Saturday. The sanctuary cleaning department, the cleaning department, every one of you, I want to thank God for you once again. I appreciate every, every single one of you. Of course, our guest music artist, J.J. Hestin and his team. And of course, Reverend Sam. Come on, give Jesus praise for the gift that Reverend Sam is to the world. What a word, what a word he brought to us today. My summary of everything Reverend Sam today is, it's a new season. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me it's a new season? Turn to three people around you quickly and tell them it's a new season. It's a new season. It's a new season. It's a new season for us. It is a new season. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now please just remain standing. Just a short word of prayer to close. As you close the service today, please, you will go to at least seven, minimum seven people you must walk up to and tell them, this is now, of course, it's our new season, but you are going to go to tell them, I'm in a new season. Okay, let me say a word of prayer, then you go to at least seven people, you tell them. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, we honor you. We receive your word with thanksgiving today that you brought to us from your prophet, O oh God, your servant, Reverend Sam Adeyemi today, that it is a new season in declaring it over us as a church collectively. We receive that word in Jesus' mighty name. And we declare same, O oh God, collectively, and say it is a new season for us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And as the children go, Father, same goes to them. It is a new season for everyone in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. It is my new season. It is my new season. It's my new season. God bless you. Drive care.